Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Peter's, the Making Waves Church, where we are making waves of difference by sharing Jesus with Ocean City and the world. And what great message that we have to share. Jesus is risen. You know, our worship theme for the next number of weeks is called Boost. You've heard the term before, give me a boost, when we just can't reach quite high enough or quite far enough, we get a boost. It's true in our daily lives, but also true in our spiritual lives. We have a boost in the resurrection of Jesus that calls us to live a fuller life. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to live into this full life because God has graced us with this power and this promise and this privilege. So we gather in worship as a boost each and every week to praise God and to have community with one another. Let's worship and give God the glory this day. Please stand. Would you turn in your bulletins for our call to worship? Now is the moment of grace. This is the hour of blessing. Today is the day of salvation. Here is the path to new life. Already joy is abounding and love is flowing. For this, for this is, is the day God is making. Let, Let us rejoice and sing. Let us pray. 
Father God, uh, these words that have come from our lips as our opening to worship is the prayer of our heart this morning, that on this beautiful day that you have created, that we might rejoice and be glad in it. As we have come to worship this day, we pray that we might sense anew the power of your presence in our life, and that we might hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, encouraging us in lives of faith. To this end, we give ourselves in Jesus' name, amen. Would you join with me in the litany of the passing of the peace? The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us use our COVID greeting to greet one another this morning. God bless you. You may be seated. Brittany Purcell, our Director of Children, Youth, and Family Ministries, is not here today. So I have the wonderful privilege of being able to share the children's message. So at this time, we'll invite our children, youth, and young at heart forward for this morning's children's message. So the thing I like to do whenever I do the children's message is try to have somebody pick a random item that we don't choose beforehand, and then connect it up with the good news of Jesus. It sounds like fun, right? Yeah, yeah. Paul, do you have anything back there? He's reaching around for stuff. He's hiding it behind his back. Let's see what, what Paul has, has for us to talk about. Let's see. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. You see what this is? It's a lighter. I'm not allowed to play with these at home. <laughs> Maybe you're not allowed to play with these at home either. But this is really, really convenient. Do you know um, how long ago people learned how to make fire? It's like a long, long, long time ago. Cave people long, right? Long, long time ago. And do you know how they made fire back then? How did they do it? How, how you make fire without matches? Yeah, exactly. Like rubbing sticks together, you know, using, using sticks and rubbing them together so fast that it creates heat and eventually a spark and eventually a, a flame. That's a lot of work. Anyone ever try to make a fire without matches? Anyone try? Yeah, it's not easy. Some uh, scouts in here, former uh, scouts. Anyone try back here? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard work. It's hard work. Flint and steel drumsticks. Yeah, drumsticks. Yeah. Flint and steel, 
all sorts of ways, and they were all very difficult, and they were all very fragile, right? I mean, they'd make a little, little spark, and it could go out if the wind blew, you know? So it's such a blessing to be able to pull a trigger, and there it is, the flame. So why am I talking about uh, making fire and, and lighting things? Is that, you know, before Jesus, it was hard sometimes for people to find God and to know that God loved them and to know uh, what God wanted from their lives. And so when Jesus came, Jesus called himself the light of the world, right? And so it was hard to find the light of the world before Jesus came, but after Jesus came, it's real easy. Jesus is always with us. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus says, I will always be with you. And so just like it used to be really hard to make fire, and now it's easy, it used to be really hard to find God, but now it's easy because of Jesus. Isn't that really good news? That's really good news. So let's bow our heads and let's all pray together. Dear God, thank you for the light of the world. Because we have Jesus, we will never walk in darkness. Amen. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for coming and sharing the message with us today. Let's clap for our children. <laughs> All right, you can go to junior church or back to your family, and we will begin to take a moment and celebrate the things that are happening in the life of the church. In case you didn't recognize him, that's Pastor Terry. He's back after four months. No doubt living it up in Florida, playing a lot of golf and soaking up a lot of sunshine. I wasn't bitter. I wasn't bitter. All winter long, I wasn't bitter. I might have mentioned it a few times to everybody, how, how not bitter I was. How not bitter I was. So we celebrate that. We celebrate Mary. Mary Moore, are you here today, Mary? Mary? Yeah, there's Mary in the front. Clap for Mary. You'll see in the bulletin that Mary is retiring. Mary's retiring at the end of the month and just prior to the end of the month. So Sunday the 15th. We're going to have a reception for her following the worship service here at 11 o'clock. And so we invite everyone to come and to share in this time of celebration. And even though Mary's retiring, she's not going to be gone from our mission and ministry here in the life of the church. Mary will become the parish visitor emeritus. And so, I mean, that's a great and wonderful news. A, past, uh, a parish visitor emeritus you know, she'll still have her picture in our, on our website. She'll still have our, her picture in our directory. Uh, she'll still be able to engage in the ministry that she's so gifted at, uh, at her leisure, at her speed, and whenever she'd like uh, in her service. And she'll still be able to use the ministry apparatus we have here uh, in order to continue to bless uh, those that she's cared for for so long and many others. So we are, we are sad to say goodbye in retirement, but happy that she will continue uh, on a volunteer basis as parish visitor emeritus. So let's clap once again for her. We welcomed uh, Chaz Flood, our contemporary worship leader, to the 9 o'clock service for the first official time today, and he and his family, uh, his wife Katie, his uh, daughter Rory, and son uh, Cy Guy. He, all of these, uh, his family really enjoyed uh, the morning, and we enjoyed having him, and it's a great and wonderful start to what will be an awesome ministry. Another celebration coming up is uh, Pastor Brian Roberts. So there'll be a celebration uh, after eight years of his serving as district superintendent. This is something that's being sponsored by the Greater New Jersey Conference. Here on the 22nd of May at 4 p.m., a special worship service with a reception to follow. 
Those details will be printed in the tidings and sent via email and on paper uh, very soon, but wanted everyone to take an opportunity to uh, mark that date. There's other dates to mark too. This, uh, this coming Sunday, the 7th, from 8.30 to 12 is the UMW Flower, Plant, and Vegetable Extravaganza, right? Very time-honored tradition here. Did I get all the details right? Because I'm doing all this from memory. Saturday. Did I say Sunday? Saturday. Yeah, that's terrible. Saturday, the 7th. Uh, from 8.30 to 12, 8.30 to 12. Uh, the following Sunday, Saturday, I just have this fixation with Sunday. Don't we all? Don't we all? Yeah. Uh, Saturday the 14th is Pancake Breakfast from 7.30 to 11. And you can purchase tickets. The special is uh, four tickets for $25. This their rolling cart is in the back. You'll be able to see somebody back there at the conclusion of the service. Uh, we also want to recognize the flowers here in the chancel and altar area today, uh, given in loving memory of Gretchen Bingham by her husband, Ralph, and all her family. Lots to celebrate uh, here in the life of the church. A couple other things to note. We will have a new member time to take in new members on Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, June 5th. So if you are not a member of St. Peter's and you've been saying to yourself, it's time for me to become a member of St. Peter's, that's gonna be the day to do it. Uh, the Tuesday before, which is the 31st of May, we'll have a short orientation, about an hour long here uh, at St. Peter's, and we welcome those who've been wanting to take that step to join uh, come to the orientation, learn about membership at St. Peter's, ask all the questions that you have, and um, then join us on that Sunday, and we'll take in new members. Also being taken in will be our confirmands that day on Pentecost Sunday, a great day of celebration. And I know I've spoken to a number of folks who aren't members here yet, but they've been looking at becoming members and highly, highly recommend uh, this great church and these great people. And so lots to do, lots exciting, busy time of year, and we are blessed because God walks with us every step of the way. Let's continue to worship. Mary, congratulations. Mary, congratulations on your honor. Let me clue you in on the reality of emeritus. <laughs> You do the same amount of work, but they don't pay you. <laughs> when the pastor was doing his children's sermon, it reminded me of a story I heard long ago about a church that caught on fire and started in the altar area and was consuming the whole building. The fire department came and finally hosed it down. The pastor recognized the captain of the fire department and said, uh, Pete, you haven't been here at church in a long time. And he said, well, there hasn't been a fire in the pulpit in a long time. <laughs> With that, I'll read the scripture. Uh, the scripture this morning is a familiar post resurrection story of Jesus uh, meeting and encountering the two uh, going from Jerusalem uh, on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them called Cleopas asked him, 
Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, because God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. begin this boost worship theme with a boost for the heart, heart boost. You know, our scripture today recounts uh, the story of two disciples leaving Jerusalem on the Emmaus Road, and their hope has been left in tatters. You know, there are things that happen individually, personally, and there are things that happen uh, community-wide, nationwide, even globally. Uh, tragedies and misfortunes, and things that strike right at the heart of all we had hoped or all we had been promised or all that we had expected and have just left that hope in tatters. These two disciples are on the road to Emmaus and their hope is in tatters. You know, yesterday I had the opportunity, I was in New York City, and I grew up not so far from New York City, about 25 miles away uh, from Manhattan. And the town I lived in, actually, uh, whenever you left town on State Highway 208, you would come over the hill and you'd immediately be greeted with uh, the skyline of Midtown Manhattan with the uh, Empire State Building and all the buildings of Midtown. And you'd come down the hill and around the corner and Lower Manhattan would come into view. A majestic skyline of Lower Manhattan with the two Twin Towers. 
And that was the view of the skyline that I grew up with daily, every day. And um, of course, in the tragedy of 9-11, uh, the Twin Towers were specifically targeted and, and destroyed. Uh, and they were targeted and destroyed, not least of all, because they were a symbol of American culture. They were symbols of uh, American ideals. You know, that was the whole point of of attacking those things because to attack those things would to be striking right at the heart of who we are, what we promise and what we offer. And so those towers, uh, they came down and uh, there was a lot of hopelessness and despair to go around. Um, but the amazing thing was that uh, the American people came together and um, were really unified in expressing unity and hope for the future. And it was a very wonderful way to make it through such a terrible time. Um, but I mention that um, because the despair and the grief and the hopelessness that comes from these events uh, can really, can really demoralize us. I didn't live in North Jersey at the time of the attacks. Uh, it was a year or so later where I was driving down State Highway 208 and that beautiful skyline opened up to me and as we came around the corner to Lower Manhattan and there were no Twin Towers. It brought tears to my eyes. So, the ancient Israelites were no strangers to events, tragedies, that struck right at the heart of who they were or the promise that God had made for them. I'm thinking to when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire from 587 BC. The people of Israel thought that God's presence was there in the temple. And when the temple was destroyed by their enemy, they were feeling hopeless and despairing. I mean, if their enemy could knock down God's house where God's presence very well was, it showed that maybe God wasn't all powerful or that the enemy would eventually win. You know, and even in Jesus' time in ministry, the promised land was being occupied by the Roman Empire. This promised land seemed like a broken promise, and the people had to endure that. And now here it happens again with the coming Messiah, who instead of reclaiming the throne of David is crucified on the cross. And so in the scripture reading that we just shared before, their hopelessness shines through. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We're not hoping that anymore. He's dead. We know how that feels. In our personal lives, we face things that make us feel hopeless. Whether these examples apply to one of us, in, any of us in particular, or to someone we know and love, we had hoped that that relationship with that man or that woman would have been the one to last a lifetime in marriage falls apart. We had hoped, but it fell apart. We had hoped for a child, but found out we can't get pregnant. We had hoped. We had hoped retirement would have been our golden years, but health problems or financial problems took that away. We had hoped. 
We had hoped for many long years with that loved one who passed away prematurely. We had hoped. And so as these two disciples go from Jerusalem down the Emmaus Road, they had hoped. And where were they going anyway? You know, when you read the scriptural accounts of uh, Jesus' teaching and ministry, uh, the expectation was these disciples had a job to do. They were actually to wait in Jerusalem for the next part of what would happen, but these two are going away. Why were they going? Maybe they were feeling so hopeless that they decided to quit and leave. It can make us feel like that when it happens to us. We can just want to quit our lives, run away. And so Jesus meets them in this. Jesus meets them in this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but they don't recognize him. They don't recognize him. Why don't they recognize him? It's funny. He's, they, they're, they're telling the story, and this is just beyond what we read today. Besides all this, it's now the third day since things took, these things took place, and moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and they, and they didn't find the body there. So they came back and they told us that they indeed had a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. So they're confessing this to this stranger on the road, and that stranger himself turns out to be Jesus. They don't recognize him. Why? Well, quite possibly, in their hopelessness, they were blinded. You know, if you've ever felt hopelessness, it gives us tunnel vision, causing us to dwell on what we lost at the expense of seeing what's ahead. Why else didn't they recognize him? Well, they put God in a box. Everybody put God in a box. Everybody defined and limited Jesus for themselves. The Messiah couldn't do this. The Messiah wouldn't do that. God can't do that. But the story of God, right from the very beginning, is that God is bigger more expansive, more limitless than we can even fathom. Our greatest imagination can't comprehend all that God is capable of. And so here, beginning in this, these accounts of the empty tomb, and the visions of angels saying he's alive, we begin to see that indeed, there is a hope for the future. And so Jesus, unrecognized journeys with these two disciples, and very likely, had he not given them this boost to their heart, they may have just kept going home, never to be seen or heard from again. This stranger begins saying things to these disciples, such as, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things before entering into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, this journeyer, stranger, interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. It's funny. God gives us these scriptures and then we either don't read them or don't read them close enough or don't read them well enough or don't read them often enough when they contain so much that draws us to the truth, promise, will, and plan of God. 
And it goes on. At the conclusion of the journey, Jesus, still unrecognized, is going further as the disciples begin to their final destination. And they urged him, saying, stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. They finally recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. We find Jesus' grace all over this story. First of all, in the breaking of the bread, which reminds us of the table of Holy Communion, that last supper that Jesus shared with his closest followers, saying, my body will be given, my blood will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Remember me, this grace that God gives in this promise of life. But not only there, throughout this journey on the Emmaus Road, there's the presence of Jesus right there, even when we don't recognize it. How many times has that happened in our lives? We're in the midst of some kind of trauma, and we're looking all over for the presence of God, and we just can't seem to put our finger on it, but we look back and see Jesus was right there the whole time. So there's the presence of Jesus. There's also confession, believe it or not, confession in here. Confession isn't just admitting when we're wrong. Confession is laying bare our hearts, our fears, our doubts, our despair. When we confess, we bring from the darkness into the light of Christ. And no darkness can survive in the light of Christ. They confess, we had hoped. And there's also the sense of community. This community at the meal, but the community that called these disciples to travel together in the first part and share in their grief together, and the community that's built when we offer hospitality to the strangers on the journey to which they thought Jesus was. And so all of this serves as Jesus' heart boost for these disciples at this time on the Emmaus Road. But they also serve as a heart boost for us gathered today, the community of faith at the table to remember God's grace and the promise of life. God is forever and always extending grace to us and giving us a heart boost. And whatever we may be facing, it is never hopeless for God with the limitless love and limitless power that God has. God is bigger. Let us pray. Lord, we confess this morning that we, like those two on the road to Emmaus, judge your presence in the world and in our lives by the myopic views of our circumstances and conditions in life. But Lord, we need to recognize that just as those men did not recognize Jesus, who was present and walking alongside them, we too need to acknowledge and recognize your presence in our lives and believe without a doubt that you're there for every situation, for every trial, for every tragedy, for every temptation that we face in life, that you walk with us, maybe unrecognized, but your presence is there. Your promise to us is, I will never leave you or forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, Lord, in our daily lives, in our moments of hopelessness and helplessness, in our times of despair, we might remember that Jesus walks with us even as he did those on the road to Emmaus. And now, Lord, as we break the bread 
and take of the cup. May it be a reaffirmation of our faith so that we might too recognize Jesus, his presence, his peace, and his power over all circumstances and all conditions of life to the end that through us, in us, he might be glorified and we might be blessed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's our time in the service when we receive our morning offering. I ask the ushers come forward as we continue to worship, bringing our tithes and our offerings.
privilege of bringing these sacrifices before you now, we give you thanks. We ask your blessing upon the gift and the giver that both might be used for your glory to bless the lives of others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the communion table this day, uh, we will be using the single-serve communion elements. So if you came in this morning and you didn't receive one of the individual communion elements, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will make sure they are in your hands by this time. So we've got that. Our ushers are in the back. Look for some raised hands, ushers, for anyone who may be missing their communion elements. It'll be a few minutes before we get there. So. I see a hand up here in the front. If you'd like to follow along with our communion liturgy this morning, you can turn to page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one, of one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, who breathed into us the breath of life and shared with us freedom and the fullness of joy. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, O God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who when we went our own way and became broken and sick and lost, and the joy had turned to grief in the fullness of time, Jesus came bringing hope, healing, redemption, and invitation by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he gave thanks to you, took bread, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it and remember me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. your Holy Spirit on us gathered here in these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. If you have your elements, it's now time to remove the first tab, the clear, thin top tab for the bread. This is Christ's body. Eat this and remember Jesus. Second tab releases the cup. Drink from this. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this and remember Jesus. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we stand for our final hymn.
Go from this worship this day in the name of the risen Christ. And may the light of Christ shine before you and be reflected by you, sharing the hope that will never be put in darkness. Go in peace and in the power of the Holy Spirit this day and every day. Amen.